Okay, good afternoon everybody. Um, a very warm welcome to today's session. As you can see from the slide, we're going to be discussing hazards in the rail industry this afternoon. Uh, my name is Andy Weber. I am going to be your moderator today. Um, our speaker, Anna, uh, is going to introduce herself in a minute, but I just wanted to do a short introduction to explain my role and, and something of the format of the, of the presentation today. So uh, I'm a principal consultant with IMAKE involved in the learning and development side of the business, um, but actually soft skills, hence why I'm not presenting this afternoon. Uh, the, um, my role is really going to be assisting Anna. Um, the presentation should last around 45 minutes, which um, minus my couple of minutes introduction should leave us around 13 or 14 minutes for questions at the end. Um, we will be saving questions till the end, but that doesn't mean you can't ask them as we go. Uh, that is my principal role, in fact, is collating and recording questions that you have that I will save up and pose them to Anna uh, when we get to the questions section at the end. There are also technical support in the background if you have any problems with, uh, with your connection or with hearing us clearly, and please do chat type a, a message in the chat box and somebody will help you out with that. Good. So without further ado, I would like to hand you over to Anna to introduce yourself, herself. Anna, welcome. Thanks, Andy. Uh, so I'm Anna Holloway. I've worked in the rail industry uh, for about 10 years now uh, doing safety and reliability engineering. Uh, first at RSSB um, and now working for Riftech Solutions Limited. So we're going to start today by giving you um, an introduction to railway hazards. Um, it's ideally aimed at people new to the rail industry or those wanting to, to revisit some of the incidents that have happened in the past. So I'll start by giving you an overview of the risk profile and how it's changed over the years. We'll then look at learning from operational incidents um, focusing on train collisions, derailments, and interfaces to the railway. We'll then look at some of the key drivers of risk in the GB rail today. Um, and on that, we're focusing on track worker hazards and the platform train interface. And as part of that, we'll look at some of the current initiatives that are in place in the industry. And then, as Andy says, we'll have some time at the end for questions and discussion. So we'll start by looking uh, at some of the changes in the risk profile. So this graph was taken from HSC's annual report, and it shows how the significant train incidents per million train miles has changed um, from 1975 down to 2001, 2002. Um, and you can obviously see a, there's been a, a downward trend there. And we're going to look at some of the implements implementations that we've put in um, to make that happen. Obviously that graph finishes at 2002, so we have another graph that's, sorry, so we have an, a second graph showing the estimated frequency of train accident related fatalities. This is from the year 2000 to 2014, and again, we're seeing a, a downward trend in that. So we'll start by looking at learning from operational experience and some train collisions. I'm going to look at Clapham Junction that happened in 1988. So in the morning of the 12th of December 1988, a crowded passenger train crashed into the rear of another train that had stopped at a signal just south of Clapham Junction Station. The trains were then subsequently sideswiped by an empty train travelling in the opposite direction. A total of 35 people were killed and there were 484 injured. Now the trains involved were what we call a Mark 1 rolling stock and it was identified that these had very poor crash worthiness. So if I show a couple of pictures here, 
you can see that there was severe damage done to the trains. And there was a loss of survival space for the passengers that were located in those carriages. So if we look at the causes of the incident, the collision was a result of a signal failure caused by a wiring fault. The fault meant that the signal would not show a red danger aspect when the track circuit immediately in front of the signal was occupied. So the signal that was meant to be protecting a train wasn't showing a red aspect. The driver of the first train saw an irregular signal aspect change and stopped at the next signal to report it. Now, the reason the driver had to stop to report that was at the time we didn't have in-cab radios. Um, so the only means to contact the signaler was to stop the train and get out of the cab and use the line side telephone. Now, in the signal itself, new wiring had been installed, but the old wiring had been left in place and was not adequately secured. The signaling technician responsible had not been told that his working practices were wrong and his work had not been inspected by an independent person. He was also performing the work during his 13th consecutive week of a seven day work week. So there was obviously um, a lot of lessons we can learn from that and there are a number of changes that were brought into the industry as a result. So the first of those was that testing was mandated on British Rail signalling work and the hours of work for employees involved in safety critical work was limited and that continues to be the case today. And the idea for that was to reduce the probability of having a wrong side failure of a system. There were other recommendations that um, were brought in. So cab radios linking the driver with the signalling system were recommended. And in addition to that, the a PA, a public address system on existing trains were recommended to be installed. And finally, the crash worthiness of the trains should be reviewed given the large loss of survival space. However, um, in 1994, we had another rail crash, this time at Cowden. And now this was a result of a signal passed at danger, which we call a SPAD. Um, so in this case, the signaling system was functioning correctly, but the driver passed that signal. Now we have a system called automatic warning system. So this provides a driver with an audio warning when they're approaching a signal that is given with a, a, a restrictive aspect. So either a, a red signal indicating that they should stop or a amber signal that's indicating that the next signal will be at stop um, and they should start slowing down. Um, in this case, it was ineffective. Um, and again, there was no CSR, which is cab secure radio. So despite the recommendation following um, Clapham's that we should install the cab secure radio and um, it had not been installed yet and the signaler could actually see these two trains heading towards each other but he had no means to contact the drivers to tell them to stop. So we had five fatalities here, 13 injuries and again it was mark one rolling stock and you can see from this picture here that again the carriages were um, very badly damaged. Um, two years later, we had another incident at Watford in 1966. Um, again, this was another SPAD. Again, the AWS was ineffective and we had one fatality and 69 people injured. So I've mentioned twice that the AWS was ineffective. Now, one of the reasons for this is that while it gives the um, driver an audio warning, the system doesn't then um, monitor what the driver does after that. So they get the warning, they acknowledge it, and then 
if they don't acknowledge it within a certain time, emergency brakes will come on to stop the train. However, if they do acknowledge it, the system then doesn't monitor how the driver carries on driving. So they don't know that the um, that the train that the driver started to slow the train down. We then had another accident in 1997. So this was the Southall rail crash. Again, another spad. In this case, the AWS was actually isolated and the CSR was not used. There were seven fatalities and 139 people injured. Now, there were a number of changes um, following the accident. So testing of AWS when trains left the depot um, were mandated. That was to make sure that we knew the AWS was working. And there are a number of changes made to the rule book. So the first was that the driver must inform the signaler if the AWS is defective. And if the AWS is isolated, a train may only run at a line speed with a competent person accompanying the driver in the cab. So this person must have a full knowledge of the route and know how to stop the train. So you're effectively having a second driver there. Um, and following the accident, CSR, so the cab secure radio, was implemented across the network. However, in 1999, we had another incident, um, the Ladbrook Grove rail crash. So in October 1999, at Labrook Grove, a driver passed a signal at danger, entering a bi-directional section of track. So here the trains can run in both directions. The trains collided nearly head-on and at a combined speed of about 130 miles per hour. The fuel tank of the diesel engine ignited and caused a fireball, um, causing a number of fires in the wreckage. A total of 31 people were killed and there were more than 520 people injured. So if we look at the contributory factors of this, at the time a automatic train protection was being implemented on this route as a trial, um, however it was not fitted. So automatic train protection um, was a supervisory system, so it looked at how the train was driving the speed it was going um, and compared this to the signaling uh, so that if the train needed to slow down in order to stop for the signal, the if, if the driver was going above this speed profile, the, brain, the brakes would be applied. However, this was not fitted to this particular train. There had been a total of eight spads at this signal in six years. The driver was new but had not been informed of this. The time of day and the direction of sunlight made the signals hard to view. So often if uh, tracks go from east to west, um, there's problems at certain times of day with the reflection of sunlight on signals. The line had also been electrified to allow the new Heathrow Express service to operate um, and new overhead electrification equipment had been placed which further obstructed the driver's view of the signal. So there's obviously a lot of integration issues there between different assets of the railway, between the signalling, between the electrification and the driver themselves. Um, in addition to this, flank protection was not in place. So flank protection, um, effectively, if a, if a train passes a signal at danger, it makes sure that a train can't be put into a collision course with another train that has the, the right of way through that, that junction. In addition to this, the signalman was not trained to use the cab secure radio. So in this case, it was fitted, but the signaler was not trained to use it. And the signaler did not contact the driver immediately after seeing the SPAD, but waited to see if the driver would stop. And that was actually in line with procedures at the time. So the legacy of this accident, we had 
an inquiry by Lord Cullen into the accident and then a separate inquiry into the regulation and the management of the industry. So obviously we've seen a number of accidents um, in a short um, number of years that led to a lot of um, concern about the industry and whether it was regulating itself correctly. There were many findings and recommendations for the industry. And one change that was implemented was to implement AWS across the network and a, a second system being the train protection and warning system, so TPWS across the network. We're going to look at what TPWS is. So the purpose of TPWS is to stop a train by automatically initiating a brake demand. And that's where a signal has passed a signal train has passed a signal at danger without authority, approached a signal at danger too fast, or approached a reduction in permissible speed too fast, or approached the buffer stops too fast. We're going to look at the functionality of this system. So the system is made up of two functions. The first is the overspeed sensor and the second a train stop system, so the TSS. And if you go onto the track you'll see you might see these located if, when you're at a, a train platform. So the idea of this system is that if a train is to approach the signal at red this system will stop the it stop the train before it reaches the conflict zone, and that's the area that's circled red. And so it's not to prevent necessarily the train from passing that signal at red, but it is to stop it reaching that conflict zone where it could collide with another train, and that's by stopping it in what we call the overlap. So as we said, it's not designed to prevent Spads, but it does mitigate against the consequences of a SPAD. Now, it's important to note that some locations only have a TSS, so not all system areas have an overspeed sensor. And there are some locations that might have two overspeed sensors at a location. So, sorry, I'm having a, a few issues with my slides here, but we'll, we'll carry on. So I thought it'd be interesting to see how the implementation of TPWS had an impact on, on SPAD reduction. So this is a graph showing how the moving annual average for SPADs um, between the years of 1999 and 2016. So you can see after the, the implementation of TPWS, we did start seeing a reduction in SPADs. Um, obviously, if the overspeed sensor is stopping trains earlier, you'll see a reduction in them in passing the signal at danger. Um, but we can see they haven't gone down to zero SPADs, and that's a, as a result of it of the primary um, function being to stop the train before it reaches that conflict zone. Now, there are a number of shortfalls in the system that we should be aware of. And um, the first is that it's based on a standard braking curve, which means it doesn't cover all rolling stock, uh, particularly freight trains that have a, a lower level of braking um, and that can lead to trains still entering the conflict zone. Now, overspeed sensors themselves cannot protect against trains that accelerate after the sensor, and that's known to have happened at buffer stops. And not all signals um, have TPWS. It's only really junctions and buffer stops. And it's really important to note that this system is, is to be replaced in the future with ETCS, so the European Train Control System. Um, and that's similar to ATP, where it supervises the train. 
um, provides a speed profile um, and intervenes if the driver is going above that speed profile that's permitted by the system. So there are some of the, the hazards and mitigations that we have um, associated with train collisions. We're now going to look at derailments. And we're going to focus first on Hatfield in the year 2000. So at Hatfield in the year 2000, an intercity train derailed approximately 115 miles per hour just south of Hatfield Station. The primary cause of the accident was later determined to be a left-hand rail fracturing as the train passed over it. Four people were killed and 70 people were injured. So we're going to look at some of the causes of this accident. So the rail had fragmented as trains passed over due to what we call rolling contact fatigue. So that means where there's repeated loading causes fatigue cracks to grow in the rail and effectively when they reach a critical size the rail fails. So at the time the rail industry had been privatised and rail track had passed the engineering knowledge of British Rail into contractors. Now rail track themselves had a comprehensive maintenance procedures to prevent the accident where followed appropriately. However, problems existed with the experience and working knowledge of the staff. And I think this highlights some of the dangers associated with organisational change um, and keeping that knowledge within the, the industry and how it's being managed going forward. Um, so we've seen a lot of organisational changes still today where roles are passed between organisations and it's key that we maintain this knowledge um, throughout to make sure that we don't have a repeat of these incidents. And one of the areas in the, the common safety method for risk um, evaluation and assessment, that is key to making sure that you assess the organisational change. Now, the outcomes of this accident, uh, so it was identified that insufficient skilled work had led to an increase in rail breaks. Rail track did not know how many other causes of rail fatigue around the world, around the network, sorry, could lead to a Hatfield-like incident, and consequently they imposed over 1,800 emergency speed restrictions and instigated a nationwide and costly track replacement programme. So this resulted in significant disruption on the majority of the national network for more than a year and cost the entire UK economy um, an estimated £6 million per day. So I think that highlights, as well as hazards um, associated with safety and risk, that can also have um, a large impact on operational and, and business risk. There was then a similar incident at Potter's Bar in 2002, again with poorly maintained points, um, resulting in seven fatalities. And again, they were looking at the roles and responsibilities of those involved. Now, finally, we're going to look at some of the interfaces that we have on the rail network to see how, how these can present different hazards. And we're going to start with great looking at the accident that happened at Great Heck in 2001. So some of you might know this as the Selby rail crash. Um, but on February 2001, a high-speed passenger train collided with a Land Rover and trailer, which had crashed onto the railway tracks. The passenger train derailed and was subsequently struck by a freight train traveling in the opposite direction with an estimated closing speed of 142 miles per hour. Ten people died, um, and that included the drivers of both trains, and there were 82 people suffered uh, serious injuries. So looking at some of the factors of the accident and how we can learn from that, 
the mark for crashworthiness was praised. Um, so the survival space was largely maintained. So compared to those accidents that we saw back in Clapham and Cowden, where there was a lot of survival space, um, we saw a improvement here in the mark for rolling stock. Um, however, they then started looking at the internal crashworthiness of the vehicles and they identified that the fire extinguishers detached and became missiles, as did the tables, waste bins, and areas of toughened glass reinforced by adhesive labels. The ashtrays opened, exposing metal spikes. Um, magazine racks also became missiles with spikes, and the first-class seats actually buckled, and the indoor, internal doors became stuck. And at the time, there was also a, a diesel leak, so if if that diesel had ignited and we had a fire, the, the fact that those internal doors became stuck could have been, um, could have had high consequences. So as part of this, the industry looked at these changes, and I think today, if you if you look at the trains, some of these features are no longer there. So the outcome of the, the accident. The Land Rover driver was charged with dangerous driving and imprisoned for five years. Yeah. Uh, and barriers from the motorway were found to be inadequate and the highways agency undertook a review of the risk of road vehicle incursions. And that continues to be done by Network Rail today to make sure that they're managing um, those interfaces. We're then going to look at Upton Nervet in 2004. So after Nerva in 2004, um, there was a rail, clash, rail crash with a collision between a train and a car on a level crossing. The car driver was committing suicide at the time. So the car derailed the train, which was exacerbated by a set of points that were located immediately after the level, level crossing. This caused the trains to move out of alignment, the carriages. Seven people were killed, including the drivers of the train and car. But however, the high structural integrity of the Mark III coaches prevented a much higher death toll, uh, plus the fact that the more lightly loaded first class coaches were at the leading end of the train. What we're going to look at is the, the consequences of this accident and how that led to some of the changes that we've seen today. So I've put a number of diagrams here um, taken from the accident investigation report and it shows the final resting place of some of the carriages. And I think it's a, the interesting point from this is to look at the fact that Coach E that was classed as having minor damage was actually the coach that had the largest number of fatalities. So four people were killed in this carriage. Uh, now, the reason for this was that the carriage turned over on its side and continued to travel along. Um, people fell against the train windows and were then crushed as, as the train continued to travel. So the industry started looking at how we could contain passengers within carriages when there's an accident. And they looked at two options. The first was laminated windows and the second being um, seat belts. So they looked at the advantages and disadvantages of each approach. Now for lam laminated windows, these obviously prevent ejection and trap crush injuries. However, they do reduce the means of exit if there was a fire. So at the time, um, there, could, there were hammers provided at the windows um, so that if you were trapped in the carriage, you could use these to get out via the train windows. Now, in terms of seat belts, again, these prevent uh, ejection and trap crush injuries. However, they can provide whiplash injuries. Um, it was also considered that they can hold passengers in the areas of loss of survival space. So when they've looked at past incidents, they've looked at where people have been located in the carriages. And some people were located in the, in the areas where you would expect to 
have have either died or received um, major injuries. However, they they through the motion of the accident they've been thrown clear of these injury these areas um, and have survived. However, if you were to use seat belts, there's a danger that they're whole, held in these areas. There were also questions raised about standing passengers. So is it acceptable that they would have a um, they wouldn't be able to have this protection measure and how would we enforce it across the industry so they looked at the the safety benefits disbenefits of this and identified that the laminate windows had the greater safety benefits for that and now the railway group standard um, 2000, 2100 contains structural requirements for rolling stock um, and that includes the body side integrity and windows. So I thought we'd look at how that this impacts us today and we'll look at two incidents. So the first being grey rigs that happened in 2007. So this was a passenger train derailment. Um, there was one fatality at this. Um, someone um, died of a heart attack as a result of the accident. But again, the crashworthiness of the, the trains was praised in this accident. If we then look at an accident that happened more recently in 2016 in Croydon, have a, a similar incident of the train um, turning on its side. However, here we had seven fatalities. Um, and again, if you look at the accident report, people fell out of the windows here. Um, so I, now the trams aren't regulated in the same way that the, tra the heavy rail industry is. Um, they aren't subject to these requirements for laminate windows. And I think we can see here where there are learning points between the two industries um, to make sure that we learn from different accidents. And finally, I'm going to finish the interfaces by looking at an accident in 2015 in Godmisham in Kent. I'm going to step through what happened in this incident. So at 20 to 9 at night, a cow was spotted and reported to the signaller by a train driver. Um, the trains were then cautioned by the signaller and a mobile operations manager or mum was sent to investigate the incident. The caution trains passed through the section and confirmed that there were no sightings of the cows and therefore just before nine o'clock the trains were returned to line speed by the signaller. About 45 minutes later the mum confirmed that they could not find a breach in the fencing. However, about five minutes earlier, a train had actually collided with a herd of eight cows and derailed. So if we look more closely at the accident, there were 67 passengers on board, plus three members of staff. There were no injuries reported at the time of the accident. So I think, again, we can see um, how potentially the, the crash worthiness of the train has improved over the years. Now, the GSMR had ceased to work during the accident. So GSMR is, a, is the current form of communications used um, in the cab to contact the signaller. However, in this accident, it had ceased to work. So after putting down some track circuit clips, um, the driver ran on foot for about three quarters of a mile to find an alternative means of contacting the signaller. At the time, an off-duty driver contacted route control using his mobile, who in turn informed the signaller, who instructed the drivers of the trains in the area to emergency stop using the GSMR. So GSMR now has a function where if the signaller is aware of an incident in an area, he can contact all the drivers in that area to tell them to stop in order to prevent any escalation of the incident.
So there's still a number of learning points from this accident. The first is to do with communications. So the conversations between the signaller and the drivers of the two trains each formed a slightly different understanding about the location of the cow due to some informal informality and ambiguity of the description of the cow's location, coupled with variations in local knowledge. So there's a breakdown of the communication between people here. The fencing had recently been reviewed as high risk, but no work was deemed required to upgrade that. And the GSMR, as we said, of the leading unit of the train became inoperative as a result of the accident. So the MCBs had tripped during the impact and this had not been identified as a hazard or failure mode during design and the driver did not know to reboot the system. So in terms of looking at the fencing and, and what we do with information when we go and inspect it, we need to make sure that we're acting upon any, any risks identified. And with regards to GSMR, we often use that as a mitigation measure to prevent any escalation of incidents. But I think it's important to note that we can't we know we can't hundred percent rely on that because that can become inoperative under certain circumstances. And that has also been the case of a train's hit a tree um in another incident. So I think those are important to note. So they are some of the incidents that have happened in the past. They've shaped the mitigation measures that we have in the industry now to protect us from those hazards. And um, we're now going to look at the key drivers of risk today and their mitigations. Now there's a number of, of key areas due to time we're focusing on two, as I said. We're going to first start looking at track worker risk. So I've put a number of um, diagrams here or figures. Um, to try and highlight some of the hazards that track workers are exposed to. So at the bottom left, we have um, high voltage, well, working at height, also uh, potential for electric shock injuries. Um, there's heavy uh, machinery moving. Um, we've got Track workers also exposed to moving trains um, as they work on and about the track. Um, and on the top left, we have some vegetation that can lead to um, irritation and burns on the skin. So it is a, it is a hazardous area for, for track workers to work in. Now, to protect track workers from moving trains, um, we're going to look at the different protection measures that are used. Now, these I've used these diagrams because I think they're useful to try and explain the differences. Um, it is taken from a withdrawn um, section of the rule book. Um, however, if we first look at what was termed a, a safeguarded area, um, this is where trains are stopped and prevented from entering sections on the area of track that you're working in. So on that double section of track, trains cannot enter that green zone. Uh, we then have a fenced area, um, again, where movement is stopped by the signaller, um, where the, the green section is provided. Trains can continue to run on the, on the second section of track, but a fence is provided to prevent track workers from wandering out of that area and into the line that, where the trains are still running. And then finally, we have a, a site warden warning um, and this is where, again, only one area of the track is protected by the signals and train movement stopped. Um, however, the trains continue to run on the second line. And there's a site warden in charge of making sure that people do not wander into that second section. So there you can see various levels of protection. We then also have what we sometimes call red zone working, and this is uh, where track workers are working on or about the line and are not protected from train movements. Now, protection is provided by equipment, and that can be 
where it provides a warning of, of train movements, so either an audio warning within enough time to allow the track workers to move clear, or it can be done by means of a lookout where, again, a person is looking for these trains and provides the warning with enough time. Now, it should be noted that I, I've used the terms green zone and red zone. Now, these aren't they're no longer recognised terms, but they're still often used. So if you're in some workshops, um, they, these terms may be used in there. So we can protect workers from trains, um, but there are, as we discussed earlier, other hazards, so slip trips and fall hazards, um, electric shock hazards um, and vegetation. So another means to protect track workers is to reduce the exposure. So reducing the requirement for them to go into this trackside hazardous area. Um, one of those means is the network rail measurement train. So this is a train that travels up and down the network and um, me me measures the, the gauge, the rail condition, um, so that we don't have to send people out to inspect the tracks as uh, frequently. And this is now being implemented in some passenger rolling stock so that we can get more and more data and ideally reduce the requirement for people to go trackside. If we look at other measures that are implemented, when we're putting new infrastructure down, there's often walking routes provided now for track workers to make sure that we keep them as safe as possible. We're constantly asked about the placement of assets. So if we have some equipment that needs to be maintained, where are we locating that? Does it need to be a mile down from the access point or can it be located nearer so that track workers don't have to walk down the tracks? We'll also look at remote condition monitoring. So there's a, a way to monitor that equipment remotely, provide data back um, so that people don't have to go out and inspect it. We also provided with portable GSMR. So we talked about GSMR being used in the cab. Um, that can also be provided to track workers. And Network Rail are also having a drive to improve the consistent um, work activity risk assessments or safe systems of work. So to make sure that track workers know what they're doing, that it's consistently applied um, so that they understand the hazards and the mitigations that are in place to protect them. Another area that Network Rail are looking at is the management of occupational road risk. Um, so an, a number of fatalities for their workforce has actually been them driving to site. So they're having a big push on this at the moment to make sure that um, they're managing fatigue um, and means of driving. So. Some of their fleet has um, speed restrictions um, and monitoring of driving anonymously. So that's track worker risk. And um, we're going to look at platform train interface. So again, there's a number of hazards associated with the platform train interface. I've put a number of um, figures, uh, diagrams again, sorry, or photos. Um, to try and highlight some of the issues and hazards. So we have curved platforms that can provide, well, result in large stepping distances. Um, curved platforms also prevent drivers or guards being able to see some of the doors. So we need another means to be able to see that there's not someone trapped in the doors um, or potentially fallen between the train and the platform. Um, Non-standardised platform heights from some of the platforms are very old. At the time where we didn't standardise platform heights can result in vertical stepping distances. Um, the use of trains can result in very high um, levels of crowding on platforms. It can result in people falling on the tracks even when there's a, not a train present and people getting trapped in the doors. So there's a number of measures that are put in place at the moment to try and reduce this risk. Some of these are initially in the design phase. So we look at platform widths 
to make sure that there's enough capacity provided for users. Uh, platform screen doors can be put in place. These are generally used in metro systems, so that prevents people falling on the track. Um, we've also got um, incentives to reduce curves and look at the lighting and PA system. There's a number of operational measures. Uh, so we have monitoring by CCTV and monitoring of staff. So that might be done at um, areas of, during the peak period, we might have more staff present um, to try and manage those risks. There's AI solutions being used. Um, so looking at passenger behavior, possibly triggering CC um, PA announcements or that. And finally, there's a number of measures being put in in communications and training. So Network Rail might go into schools um, to teach children of the hazards of the railway. There's also a number of adverts, both verbal, verbally and um, in, in visually in the stations and some videos are put in social media areas to try and highlight the hazards. We're going to look at one of those videos now um, to finish off. And this is an incident that happened at Nuneaton Station. So this is provided by RSSB to highlight some of the risks of the platform train interface. Um, so here, a freight train is entering the platform. Um, there's a girl on the platform with her pushchair, which um, she nudges unintentionally towards the train. And you can see as the train is passing, it's pulling the pushchair towards it. Now, oh, thankfully, there was not a child um, in the pushchair during this incident, um, but I think it highlights the, the risk that we do have on the platform train interface. So, in summary, um, the de design, organisation and regulation of industry has been shaped by past incidents. We've tried to learn from them and improve it going forward. I think in an age where there's fewer catastrophic incidents, it's important to remember these and why we have certain processes and design in place so as not to repeat the accidents. I think there's still a lot to learn from incidents that occur today and these can be shared across the rail industry in both the heavy and light rail. So a lot of the accidents I've talked about today have been from the main line, um, but it, I think it's important that we learn from these across the industries. And we continue to look for ways to mitigate the residual risk, focusing on design and operations. So I hope you've enjoyed that. I'll, I'll pass you back to Andy. Very good. Thank you so much, Anna. Very interesting. And, and particularly interesting to see how things have changed over time from a, a layman's perspective and not involved in the rail industry. Um, I've been looking forward to this to this talk and um, not disappointed at all. Very good. There's been a little bit of interaction in the chat box and some uh, questions going backwards and forwards. Um, if you have any further questions that you want to ask, then please do um, uh, fire away right now. But we, um, I've recorded a few that have been, 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 um, been typed in already, and despite uh, a bit of discussion about some of them uh, and some answers already from from some other participants, um, still would be useful to get, I think, your your opinion, Anna. Um, question from James: um, Do you have any understanding uh, about how the industry is considering the new risk of cyber attack? Um, and in particular on signalling and safety systems. So, so they are are looking at that. It's obviously a growing area that's, that's that can change quite quickly. Um, 
traditionally we've always tried to keep um, security, so say terrorism, separate from looking at safety. Um, cyber security is, is testing that relationship because obviously there's a there's a clear um, interaction between, particularly as we move more towards using technology um, as opposed to um, people. Um, so they they are looking at that. Um, there's different standards that are out now um, in providing, depending on the type of systems you're using and the connections you've got, um, they, there's different levels of protection measures that you have to put in place. Um, I know Net Network Rail have, have their own set. There's, they're looking at a European basis as well. Um, and we're seeing that m a requirement to put, where we have a traditional safety case put forward for safety hazards, there's a the cyber um, mitigations are, are coming into that as well. So it, it is being looked at. Um, that's not particularly my speciality, um, but it's certainly something that that we're looking that is being looked at by the industry. Very good. Thanks, Anna. Um, uh, another question from Matthew this time. What are the principal causes? This actually generates a little bit of discussion on, in the chat area, um, but nonetheless, your, your view would be helpful, I think. What are the principal causes found for SPAD events nowadays? So, um, so SPADs, there's, there's a number of different causal factors that can, can lead to SPADs. Um, we, we've talked about um, Say assets um, in the past where we've we've put in new electrification schemes and preventing them being able to see. Um, in terms of um, say weather conditions, so with the sunlight we're trying to reduce by putting hoods on um, the signals to prevent that that glare um, occurring. Um, but if you say have a, a foggy morning again, you can still um, cause issues with the drivers being able to see the signals. Um, during leaf fall season, um, there's a reduction in um, being able to, the, the braking capacity of that. So even if the train drivers are, are slowing down for that signal, they can still um, spab the signal as such. Um, there has been a discussion of looking at, um, at AWS, so if there's an area where you're repeatedly approaching um, signals, the drivers um, acknowledging the AWS, um, but if it becomes too repetitive, um, they might not um, actually slow their train down. So that there's a lot of areas that they're looking at um, that might cause ads. Um, if, I'm not sure what which um, causes people were discussing on the chat, and whether I've touched on any of those. Um, I think yeah, I think I think uh, touched on and added to. Um, I think Anna, thank you very much for that. Um, another one, perhaps a quite a quick one. Uh, Jonas, Jonas, sorry, Jonas was asking, what are the new terms for red and green zones for track workers? Is there, is, are there new terms? Um, that are so um i don't think that i don't think there's a new term as such but um they, there's different protection which ultimately align again with the red and green which is which is why i used it um but they effectively now as guidance looks at different protection measures looking at the ultimate um where you've stopped all trains by the signalers down to having a lookout um i i would have to look up what the specific terms are i'm afraid good no problem um our our resident question answer in the chat was was unsure of the new terms as well for that one All right. okay <laughs> <laughs> um uh, james just asked is there a future in joining ai safety tech as sending some cars into trains to help prevent collisions so I would say there, there I would say there is shared learning between them. 
So in the new train signalling system, so ERTMS that will be coming out, um, works by providing um, trains with an, a, a, an area up to which they can proceed with a um, speed profile that they need to maintain keep to in order to prevent trains colliding together. Um, in terms of AI that's in cars, I assume that's looking at some of these interfaces to try and protect it. Um, I think there will be cross-learning probably between both industries. Um, with trains, trains and cars are different in the fact that trains have to stay on the rails they don't deviate as much as the cars so um i would say there is learning to be had between them um obviously they're, they're quite different systems um in terms of speed and and size so how how reactive the two systems can be in order to be used across um i'm not too certain on very good. Thank you very much. Um, probably time for just one more question, maybe two. Might squeeze the second one in. Um, uh, one that came earlier on, um, and actually this one that uh, one that occurred to me. Why do drivers pass signals uh, when they're at danger? So um, possibly, t well, touched on that. It's similar reasons for for why we still have spads today. So um, they're not in well. They're not intentionally driving past them. Um, it can be the weather conditions not being able to see. Um, often, if you, if it's a very busy area where you have multiple tracks, there'll be multiple signals um, for a driver. They might misread the, the signal that's in front of them. Um, they might be read it from a, of a different track. Um, so, the system's there to try and prevent that, but there's there's a lot of human factors issues there. Um, it's, a, it's a bit like people sometimes going through red signals on the on the roads that they don't intentionally go past them, but that they might have been distracted by something that they they haven't seen it. Great, thank you very much. Great, I think we've probably um, just got enough time to to just run through a couple of wrap up slides. So uh, uh, once again, thank you, Anna. There's been lots of Thank you messages in the chat box for you. Um, really interesting presentation today. Thoroughly enjoyed it myself as well. Um, and I just want to wrap up by mentioning a couple of upcoming events that you might be interested in. Um, and also, Anna, just to thank you for struggling through with your with your technical issues. Uh, I'm also experiencing those. So uh, there's another webinar coming up on the 24th of May uh, about engineering the supply chain. And then further to that, there are some training workshops that you might be interested in, um, dates and uh, titles identified there on the screen. So just remains for me to thank you very much for your attendance. Uh, thank you, Anna, once again for your uh, great presentation. If anybody has any questions or needs further information, there are contact de details for you there on the screen. I think Dan has been posting some links for you uh, in the chat box as we've been going along as well. But if you wanted any further information, then please do not hesitate to get in touch. Very good. Thanks very much indeed, one and all, and um, hopefully see you all again on future sessions. Thanks. Bye-bye.